Um, so this is joint work with uh, Krishnendu Chedati, who is at IST Austria, uh, Wolfgang Dvorak, who sits over there, uh, uh, and Veronika Luizenbauer. OK, so I want to first teach you some new problems and then tell you what you know about these new problems. OK, so first I'll tell you about new problems that actually come from model checking. Okay. But doesn't seem to work. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure whether this pointer works. Okay. Um, so assume you want to design a new system, and um, how do, do people usually go around it? First, the more uh, organized people, they first write down a formal specification, and then they might want to che have this for, uh, specification checked um, whether it has any problems. Bugs. Okay. Um, other people are more sort of let's go do it. Um, so they first write a program, they implement something, and then they have a program that might have might be correct or not. They're not sure. So then they build an abstract model, modeling the program, and then again they might want to have this checked. <coughs> so the result of the model checker can be that it says, okay, we have not found any bugs, or it can be to say there are these and these problems, and then there's a feedback loop and they might adjust then the program or the specification or even the system design. So now we want to talk about this part here. What algorithmic problems arise in the model checker? Okay, now there are multiple models that people use and I will introduce the first two, um, which are also the easiest ones. I would like to Okay, which are also the easiest ones. Um, so one is simply direct the graphs. So the node in this graph will be a state of the system. You can think of the state of a system as uh, the value of all possible variables in your program, for example. And the edges in the system are as follows. If there is a way uh, to have a transition from one state to the other state, you insert an edge. For example, if the program adds a value to a variable, then you go from one state to the other state. Okay? Good. So that's the simplest thing. However, uh, very often there are some inputs from the outside world and uh, so th there might be system transitions that are not caused by your program because there's some input from the outside world. Um, for example, you get, might get some experimental data from the outside world or you might have uh, some messages come in and uh, these messages might come in over some lossy channel so there's some random noise at, uh, that comes with this kind of information. Or you might also have some randomized protocols where you're not sure who succeeded in doing something. Okay, so they, these kind of uncertain situations usually are modeled uh, by introducing specific types to nodes. So our graph will now become a Markov decision process um, very simply by saying nodes are of two types. Either they are of the first type, these are the nodes that we all know and love from graphs, the standard nodes, or they are random nodes. And every random node has a probability distribution on the outgoing edges associated with it. And for the purpose of this talk, you can just assume um, that this is a uniform distribution. Even though it doesn't have to, and it all works fine if it's an arbitrary distribution, as long as every edge has a non-zero probability. A truly constant probability, I should say. Okay, so this is an obvious generalization of graphs. And then there are more complicated models, which I'm not going to get into here. Now, what do we want to do on these things? Um, well, we want to generate infinite paths on either graphs or MDPs. And we would do this as follows. Um, we place a token at a start node. So you assume you're given more as a start node. We will place a token on the start node. And um, this token will now get moved uh, over the edges as follows. If the token is currently at a random node, then uh, you pick the out edge according to the distribution for that node. The out you know, remember for each random node we have a distribution on the out edges. And if the token, okay, so let's do that. And if the token is at the player one node, huh, it works. Um, then um, the algorithm gets to choose which out edge. Okay, player one, which will be the algorithm, gets to choose with which out edge. Okay, so now you can move things around, okay, in this graph forever. 
And now look at all the places that the token visited. That will give you an infinite path. Okay. And now let omega be the set of all possible infinite paths induced uh, on the way in this way on the Markov decision process or on the graph. OK, so now I've told you models. I've told you infinite graphs, uh, paths. Now I want to tell you about what do we want to compute on these graphs. And that's what people in model checking uh, call objectives. OK, so what are our objectives? Um, that's what we want to compute. Um, so uh, objective is always a subset of the set of infinite paths. And one very simple objective is, uh, you, and you're usually given some set T, some subset of the nodes in the graph. And or oh, uh, MDP, okay. and so a very simple objective is just reach of t. Reach of t is the set of all nodes that visit an arbitrary node of t at least once. Okay. All this set of all these paths. For example, why is this interesting? Well, um, assume each vertex actually, actually represents the state of i processes. I is larger than one, and they all want to use some shared resource. And then some t might be the set of states that represent uh, the f situations where each process has used the resource at least once. And so if you want to check, is it true that every process will use the resource at, at least once? You want to check whether actually with your algorithm it's true that uh, reach of t is fulfilled. That all the infinite paths that are generated by your algorithm actually will visit a node in t at least once. <coughs> now the dual problem of reach is safety. And dual means um, if you take the set omega of all possible paths, you take out reach. And what's left over is called safety of t. Now, safety of t are all the paths um, that never visit a vertex of t. And that's interesting because you see, if the set t is all the bad states, you want to be sure that you never get to a bad state. Okay. So that's the first, the most simple objectives are these two. And now let's do it. Let's go to a little bit more sophisticated objectives. So the next one is called Büchi, also called Buki for people who can't pronounce Büchi. <laughs> and I keep on going back and forth, excuse me, because I keep on working with people who can't pronounce it, so they say Buki, so I say Buki, but then I talk to my husband who says, this is Büchi. <laughs> so I try to stick with Büchi. Uh, okay, so Büchi. Um, so these are all paths that visit T infinitely often, okay? And that seems like a good idea. Like if T is a set of states where process is in good shape, you know, you know, no problem so far, you want to get there infinitely often. We call Bichy again the dual, so that's all the paths that visit T only finitely often. Okay. Um, so now you know four objectives. So now um, we have uh, models, graphs are MDPs, we have objectives. Now what do we want to do? So there will be three types of algorithmic questions. And I'll go again from the simplest to the most complicated one. The first uh, type is the decision version. And the de decision version is as follows. Assume you, for a graph, you're given a start node. Is there an infinite path that satisfies the objective? Okay. Objective, you're given a fixed objective like reach or safety or bookie or co-bookie. Um, is there an infinite path that satisfies it? So for example, for a reach of t, it would be very simple. Is there a path from the start node uh, to a vertex in t? Um, uh, by the way, with this infinite path, you might say, what if I cannot generate infinite, an infinite path? What if there's a node with no outage? Well, we get rid of it. We only want to have uh, graphs or MDPs where every node has at least one outage. Okay? So at least it could also be a self-loop. Self-loops are okay, too. Okay? But in this way, we can always have infinite paths. Okay, and so if you have a path from the start node to vertex in T, just go to this vertex in T, and then from there on there must be some infinite path, it doesn't matter, take any arbitrary one, that will generate an infinite path um, that visits T at least once. For Büchi, um, um, you can, uh, this problem is equivalent to saying, uh, uh, can the start vertex reach a strongly connected component that contains a vertex in T? Because if you get to a strongly connected component that contains a vertex in T, in there you can visit this node in T infinitely often. Okay. For MDPs, um, the question is as follows. Given a start node, is there a strategy for player one that ensures that the objective is satisfied with probability one? 
Now, let me define what I mean. So strategy, strategy and I'll give you a bit of a simplified version here of the strategy. Uh, a strategy is just a function uh, from a node to the neighboring node. Okay. So a strategy is um, a decision that player one makes that says, whenever I'm at this node, I will take this outage. Okay. Now, in reality, in reality being for more complicated objectives, you actually need a little bit more complicated strategies. Because the way here I define the strategy is every time when the token comes to the fixed node, um, the player one that has fixed the strategy has to take the same outage. And for more compli this is fine you, uh, for the simple objectives. For more complicated objectives, you can actually show that the strategy also has to depend on the history, on the path that you have taken so far to get to this node. And so depending on different histories to get to this node, there might be different outages that the player might want to take. But you can prove for the simple objectives that I've talked about so far, um, there exists a strategy, a more sophisticated strategy that looks at the history, if and only if there exists one of these simple strategies, which means it's actually fine. Uh, the player can always take the same edge at the same node. Okay? So a strategy is a decision that the player makes that whenever he gets to a node, he takes a certain outage. And now the question is, uh, can you uh, ensure that the objective is satisfied with probability one? So what does that mean? Look, for example, at this NDP. This here is a random node, has three outages. Um, now, what is the probability that an infinite path gets to this node at least once? Well, it's one. It starts there. Okay. What's the probability that an infinite path gets to this node at least once? Well, what can the infinite path do? It can be here, and it always has to pick a random outage. So it, will, it could pick this loop for quite a while, but at some point, with probability one, it's going to get off this node. It's either going to take this or this outage. Whenever this happens, well, then it might get to this node or this node. And now player one, I should say, wants uh, the objective to be fulfilled. So player one is always behaving so, as we, so that we can fulfill it. Okay? So whether uh, the token comes here or here, player one will choose the edge that makes the objective be true. So if we want to get reachability for this node D here, we want to get there, player one will make it sure. This means that with probability one, we will get to this node. Okay. So if we, make, if we ask reach for this node, it's going to be, uh, uh, this node will be in it, because the probability of reaching this thing here will be one. Good. Um, what about this node? What's the probability of getting to this node? Well, so again, we start here. We might do a few self-loops. But then at some point, uh, the token will get off, either this one or this one. And now they're both equally likely. So actually, the probability of reaching this node is a half. And the probability of reaching this node is a half. Okay. So uh, player one cannot guarantee that this node here is reached with probability one. It cannot guarantee that this one is reached with probability one. Okay. So that's. Uh, the explanation of what it means that the objective is satisfied with probability one. I'll uh, have a few more examples. If this thing is happening, it goes forward. Yeah, so if, uh, if I actually say uh, this node back here, node D, is the set T, uh, what is reach? What, ah, yeah. So, so far, so good. Sorry. Now I'm going. Sorry, this was the decision version here of the problem. Now I'm going to the winning set version. So this will be my second algorithmic question. And this is the one that's usually studied. I introduced only the previous one to get you familiar with the problem and to make it easier to define this one. OK, so the winning set computation, this is usually what they want, uh, they being the people model checking. They, wanna, they give you a graph and they give you an objective, but they will not give you a start node. But instead they say, find me all start nodes that th such that there is, this objective can be fulfilled. So uh, give me also on a graph, it means give me all start nodes for which there is an infinite path that satisfies the objective. Okay. So um, basically, you can think of it as doing the decision version on every possible node in the graph. Okay. So for reachability, would simply be find me all nodes that can reach a vertex in T. Or for Büchy, it is um, if no vertex in T belongs to a strongly connected component, well, then there is no starting node that can visit T infinitely often. 
so then you will return the empty set. And otherwise, uh, you return all nodes that reach um, an SEC. This you should say an SEC that contains a node of T. Because there might be multiple such SECs that contain a node in T. OK, and on MDPs, we have the corresponding problem. So again, you want to find all start nodes for which there's a strategy for player one to ensure that the objective can be satisfied with probability one. So just like before, we're doing this decision problem on all nodes, and all the ones where the decision problem said yes, these are the ones that we should return. OK? So now here, assume that I, and this is usually called the almost true winning set, or just winning set. And up here, you can also talk, call it the winning set. Okay. So for example, here, if you say t is equal to this node d, what is the winning set? So we said already before that if you start from this node, um, you can definitely get here with probability 1. So the answer, this node will definitely be in the winning set for this objective. But also, if you're here, player 1 has a strategy to visit this guy infinitely often. Just go here and then stay here forever. Or if you're here as well. Or if you already start here, you can also just loop forever. Okay. So actually, if you make uh, D to be the target set T, the winning set is V. If you uh, say B or C, these are our target sets, these two nodes. The target set consists of t these two nodes. Well, obviously, D cannot be in the winning set. There's no way for D to get to B or C. Um, now, what about B itself? Well, B itself, of course, is in the winning set. You, if you start here, you just stay here. Um, what about C? Um, C is not in the winning set, because from C, you can only go here. Mistake. You can only go here. And A? Now, A is actually also in the winning set. Why? Because for A, with probability 1, you will get either to B or C. And if you, uh, no, actually, wrong again. A is also not in the winning set because if you manage to get here, then you go over here, and you will not see this, uh, sorry, for reachability, sorry. For reachability, it is in the winning set. For Bushi, it's not in the winning set, sorry. For reachability, if you started here with probability 1, you get either to B or C, and then you have seen it once. You don't need to do it infinitely often for reachability, sorry. Um, and so C was also in the winning set because if you start here already, you have seen it already once. Okay, fine. So that was still the simple case. The more sophisticated case is if you only have B, if the target is only B, what's happening then? Well, D will not get to it, C will not get to it. What about A? A has only a probability of half to getting to B, thus it's also not in the winning set. So only B itself is in the winning set. Okay? Okay, good. Uh, so that's what we have seen so far. We have seen two algorithmic questions and four objectives. Now I need to introduce a few more objectives because it's still very limited what you can express with these objectives. So uh, the, there will be four more objectives I need to introduce. So the first one is uh, the conjunctive and the disjunctive objectives. Now what are conjunctive objectives? Assume you have a list of objectives. Um, now. Assume you want the intersection of these objectives. Remember that for objectives, it's a set of infinite paths. And so this is the intersection of these sets. OK, so for example, reach of T1 and reach of T2 would be all paths that have to reach a node of T1 and of T2. Okay, And so it's the intersection of these sets. And you can also do it disjunctive. Um, so then it's the or of the objectives. So for reachability, it's actually very simple. Uh, reach of T1 or reach of T2 is unnecessary because you could have immediately said reach of T1 union T2. Okay, so some of these combinations will make sense, some are redundant. Okay, but I'm introducing this because there are two famous objectives, the Rabin objective and the Street objective, um, that are used, that are defined using disjunctive and conjunctive um, objectives. So uh, let me actually start with a street pair. A street pair, a one pair street objective, is given two sets, an L and a U, two sets of nodes, L of U. And it asks, co Büchi of L or Büchi of U, which you can also rewrite to Büchi of L implies Büchi of U. So what this says is, uh, we want to have all paths, infinite paths. And if a path has visited L infinitely often, that's what Büchi says, then it also must visit U infinitely often. So if you think of L as being a potentially dangerous state, but you know that the nodes in L are okay if afterwards you have visited a node in U. Then what you want here is it's okay to visit L infinitely often, but if you, you then must also guarantee that U gets visited infinitely often. 
So then you know every visit of L gets compensated for by a visit to U. And there's a generalization of both Bushi and co -Bushi. And so the street objective is now, you're not just given one such pair LU, you give them a whole bunch of them, K of them, and now you have the end of this. So for all these pairs, this condition, this one pair street condition must hold. Okay? And then the dual of it is the Rabin objective, which you just flip everything around, uh, you get the one pair Rabin, this Bushi of L, and co Bushi of U. So the path has to visit L infinitely often, and U only finitely often, and then you have the OR of the one Rabin. That's the Rabin objective. Okay, and so these are really well studied and well used. Okay? Good, now we got all the objectives. Now my very last definition um, it will be, I will introduce a third algorithmic question. Okay, so we had already these two algorithmic questions. Here comes the third one. And it's gonna look very similar to this uh, disjunctive objective, but it's different for some, in some settings at least. And this is called a disjunctive query. Okay, that's my very last definition, sorry. Um, so disjunctive query is as follows. Assume you're given k objectives, give me all the start nodes, such that there is a strategy that satisfies one of the objectives, with probability one. So not the or of the objectives, but one of the objectives. And here is an example that makes clear what this means. So look at this graph with the start node again, and let's say the set T, uh, we have, uh, let's say we have three objectives. One is um, T1, the other one is T2, the other one is T3. Um, now, if you have a dis uh, disjunctive query, you ask, is there a, a strategy for the player to almost surely reach one of T1 or T2 or T3? If you have a disjunctive objective, um, then you ask, uh, does player one have a strategy to reach either T1 or T2 or T3? Almost surely. Almost surely means with probability one. Okay? So that's completely trivial. Like, for example, um, if you start here, let's say, then anything, no matter what the player one does, he goes here, let's say, or it doesn't matter here or here, and then he, from here the random node picks one of these things, and then uh, he again picks one of them, let's say this one, and he goes here, and now with uh, probability a half, it will go here, with probability half, it goes back. So if this path just runs, it can take different nodes here. If it just runs long enough, then at some point, one of these things here will be taken. You don't care which one. In a disjunctive objective, you don't care which of these nodes will be picked. One of them will be picked uh, with probability one, okay? So you know this set, T1, T2, T3, will be visited with probability one, no matter what player one does. If you, however, uh, insist on that not, you're not okay with having one of the sets be picked, the set be picked, but having one specific node be picked with probability one, okay? Then you have a disjunctive query and then player one has to be a bit more careful. So here in this case, for example, if player one here always takes the highest node, and then from here, let's say, always picks this, this one here, the second node here, then he can do that. He can take this path here forever, and at some point, uh, he will get to T2. So with probability one, he can get to T2. So actually, he can make sure that T2 gets reached. Okay, so the difference is here the player cannot determine which node gets reached out of the T, out of T1, T2, T3. He just knows one of them gets picked. But here he can actually fix which one gets picked. Okay, that's the distinction between the two. Okay, so now we are all done. So I've introduced graphs or MDPs, I've introduced all the objectives that I want to talk about, and I've introduced the algorithmic questions. And there are some combinations here that make sense and others don't, meaning making sense meaning a disjunctive query on graphs is actually the same thing as a disjunctive objective. This difference between queries and objectives, disjunctive queries and objectives only happens on MDPs and so on. Okay, but now uh, why is this interesting? Well, so far people in model checking have not had a fine grain approach, okay? So they only classified problems by are they MP complete or co-MP complete or not? Or are they polynomial time, okay? Uh, so for example, there is a more complicated uh, model which are these game graphs, and there if you do the Rabin objective, it's MP complete, and if you do the street objective, it's co-MP complete. But it was known that both Rabin and street are polynomial on NDPs and on graphs, and so they were considered equivalently hard. Okay, and now what we do is, we look at it from the fine grain lens, and we say, can we separate them? And it turns out, yes, we can get some interesting separations. 
So we can show, first of all, a model separation. So for some of these problems, and I'll explain which ones, we can show that they're actually harder on MDPs than on graphs, meaning we can give an algorithm that beats the lower bound that we can get for MDPs. Um, then we can also show that sometimes an objective is really truly easier than its dual objective. So especially we can show that street is easier than Rabin, both on graphs and on MDPs. And finally, we can also show that for all the problems we have here, disjunction is always harder than conjunction. So if you take any of these problems that I've listed and you do a disjunctive version of the objective or a conjunctive version, uh, then the disjunction is harder. So specifically, so for separating MDPs to graphs, uh, we can show even if you just take the simple reach or Büchi objective and you use disjunctive queries, then on graphs we have an algorithm that runs in time m plus n times k. So m is the number of edges, n is the number of vertices, and the k is the number of target sets that you have. Okay. So remember, it's a disjunctive queries over k different target sets. Okay, we get this. While we get lower bounds on MDPs, which are larger than this, k times almost quadratic in M, or just almost uh, quadratic in M. And I will show you both of these reductions. Um, and we also have, actually, for MDPs, we have an algorithm that matches uh, these upper bounds, at least for large enough values of k. So there's no hope that we can make this lower bound stronger. Um, and then also for co Büchi, we can show a separation. Um, for, we can show a separation for an objective in its tool, and so the thing you're very uh, the most proud of is the one that you can show that actually street is easier than Rabin, both on graphs. So we give an, an algorithm here. So the green results are all the new results. This one here was from our previous paper here. We had given an algorithm for street for n squared plus n k log n, and we now have this lower bound on Rabin, it shows that this is harder, and. Uh, Actually, we also have a new algorithm generalizing the previous one on graphs to MDPs for street on MDPs, which again uh, is faster than the lower bounds we can get for Rabin. Okay, and finally, uh, the separating separation between conjunction and disjunction. So for all these problems here, um, we can show that uh, conjunction is easier than disjunction. And now in this talk, I've given you a bunch of definitions, but I will show the proofs uh, for the disjunction of reachability in graphs or MDPs, uh, in MDPs actually, um, because uh, you know it's easier when you go to prove when you see all these new models to concentrate on one and show the proofs for that. Okay, so I'll do, I'll show you here, I'll show you yeah this one here, this lower bounds here, and then I'll show you an algorithm which shows that this is tight. Okay. And so this will be a reduction from triangle detection. Um, you know uh, triangle detection. Um, so we assume here that there's no combinatorial time algorithm that runs in subcubic time uh, that detects whether the node, uh, whether the graph contains a triangle. Okay, and we, this will give you this bound here. And the reduction is as follows. So take your graph T and make uh, four copies of the nodes. <clears throat> Insert edges as usual, if there was an edge from A to B in the original graph, insert edges here between all these layers. Insert a start node at the beginning. Oh, and then make a fifth copy. Okay? But the fifth copy is connected as follows. These, all these nodes here are player one nodes, except for the fourth copy, which is a random node. And then it has an edge to these target nodes. Okay? So the, fourth, the fifth copy of the graph will be the target set TA, and the target set TB, and the target set TC. Each Target set consists out of one node. Okay. So now, what's interesting? So assume uh, there exists a triangle in this graph. Okay. Let's just say you can go A, B, C, A. Then um, there is a strategy for player one to make sure that this set T A here is reached. How? Well, uh, the player should just follow the triangle all the time. Okay. So you, he, when he's here at the start, he goes to the node that's on the triangle, let's say A, and then he follows the triangle, gets here. Now, the random node might send him back, but if he does this infinitely often, that was probably one he will get here. So if there is a triangle, then um, this node S here is in the almost true winning set. Um, on the other side, assume 
um, that S is in the almost true winning set. Well, then look at the infinite path that gets S there. The, that infinite path must get one, exactly one of these things here, in with probability one. Okay, into the, uh, again, must uh, reach this thing here with probability one, which means um, that, let's say it reaches this with probability one, which means that this node here must have been visited infinitely often. If it wasn't visited infinitely often, it couldn't get there. And even more, no, not only does this node have to be visited infinitely often, none of the other nodes can have been visited infinitely often. Because if they were, then there would be also non-constant probability to get here, non-zero probability to get here, and then the probability to get here would not be one. So the, the corresponding node here was visited infinitely often, and none of the others were visited infinitely often. Now, how is this possible? This is only possible if there was a triangle containing this node. Because if there's no triangle, then half of the time you have to go to another node. At least half of the time. Okay? So actually, there is a triangle in the graph if and only if player one has a strategy to visit exactly one of these nodes with probability one from S, which means S is in the winning set for the disjunctive reachability query. Okay? <coughs> Should I say this again? Oh, it's okay. Is it here? And now, how large is this reduction? Well, we had n nodes. Uh, we have as many edges as in the original graph. And uh, k, the number of sets that we needed, were n. We had n target sets, each of constant size. So beta is the total size of the target sets. So this shows that if you could solve the disjunctive reachability query uh, in time k times uh, nodes to the 2 minus epsilon, then actually triangle detection would be solved in time uh, really subcubic. Yeah? They would just plug in this value of k. Okay, so this shows this lower bound. And since this problem for MDPs, okay, and since this problem can be solved on graphs in n plus k in time, this shows that this problem is harder on MDPs than on graphs. So this gives us a separation between the models. Okay, now we have also reduction from orthogonal vectors that gives this bound orthogonal vectors, uh, you have two sets of d-bit vectors, um, d is log n, and um, each set has size n, and there's no uh, sub-quadratic algorithm to decide whether there's a vector, a pair of vectors that's orthogonal. Okay, so here what we do is, um, for each vector in the first set, we create a node, for each vector in the second set, we create a node, for each dimension, we create a node. This here will be random nodes, so this is player one nodes, and now there is an edge from a node in player one, in set one, to a co coordinate if this is set to one. And there is an edge over here if it's set to zero, if the corresponding coordinate is set to zero. Okay, so because this is zero, there's an edge to coordinate one, and because this is one, there's this edge. Okay, and then again we have, for all the guys in S2, all the vectors in S2, we have target nodes. Okay, now the reduction is as follows. So assume there exist two orthogonal vectors u and v, then player one should pick them. Meaning, so when player one is here, let's say this node is actually orthogonal to, to this one. So then when player one is here, it should pick always the strategy going to this node. Then this one here will send him to out, could be multiple coordinates, here's just one, to this one. And then when he's at this node, again, he always should pick uh, this one. You should pick uh, the vector v. This is possible because these two things are orthogonal, so there must be, wherever there is a one here, so wherever the random node will send him, there must be a zero in the corresponding coordinate, meaning there must be this edge. Okay. So if there are two orthogonal vectors, then this is actually a strategy that exists. And then if you place this forever, the strategy that at some point you will get here. So, yes? What if a vector is one is just all zeros? If here one guy is just all zeros? Yes. But then already when you build the graph, you figure out that it's orthogonal to everything, then you're immediately done. So then already uh, building this only takes time linear in, in the sets and in the size of the graph. So then in linear time, you have answered the query. Yeah, that's always with all the other reductions also. If it's a trivial answer, you find it by building the reduction and you're done. Okay, now the other case. So assume there exists a strategy um, that is winning. Okay, so that from S um, you can actually uh, get to one of these nodes with probability one. 
Okay, let's say you can get to this one here with probability one. Um, then look at the strategy. What does player one do in order to get here? A player one has to make always the, makes always the same choice here at S, and then makes always the, the same choice at the coordinate in the middle vector. Okay, so. The claim is, so he picks some u here, and he picks some v here. By picking a, uh, an outgoing edge, he picks a node here. And by picking here an outgoing edge, he picks a node here. So the claim is that this node u that he picks here and node v that he picks here, that they are actually orthogonal. Well, why is this? Um, so since he, can, since he can get from here to a node here, okay, this random node will send him to one of the coordinates. And no matter which coordinate this node will send him, there was always the possibility, infinitely often, could you get to the node, um, U, the node V, infinitely often. So the, let's say this was node U, this was node V, that player one picked in the strategy that's winning. Okay. So since he was able to get here infinitely often, this means that no matter which uh, coordinate vector here, coordinate node uh, player, the random node would send him to, there was always the possibility of getting to this node here infinitely often. This means that no matter where the ones were here, so this guy can only send him out if there's a one in the coordinate. He can only send him to a coordinate if there was the one here. So no matter which one, like for example for this one, he could send him to all three. But no matter which one he sent him to, there was always for him the possibility to get to the corresponding um, V node which means there must have always been an edge to the V node, which by our definitions of the edges means there must have been a zero. So everywhere where there is a one here, there must have been a zero here. So for, I mean, this guy is not orthogonal, but this guy is orthogonal to this one. And so um, he has only one out edge, but if there had been another coordinate with an out edge here, let's say with a one, and the, there was always a possibility to get here, that means there must have been an edge here, which means there must have been a zero on this, on this coordinate for this node up there because uh, there was this edge here. So the, from the fact that there is an edge, we can deduce that wherever there's a one here, there is a zero here, which means that these two vectors are orthogonal. Okay. And now the size of this reduction, again, it uses um, n nodes and n log n edges. And so the same argument as before then shows that if you could solve this faster, then um, edges uh, subcubic in the num subquadratic in the number of edges, or k times the number of edges to the one minus epsilon, then you would solve orthogonal vectors faster. So this gives you the lower bound uh, uh, relative to the number of edges. Okay, okay. I have five minutes left. I started a little late. Yes, okay, good. So now let me quickly tell you about the algorithm for disjunctive reachability in MDP. So this is the upper bound that shows that these lower bounds are tight, at least for large enough values of k. Now I have to introduce the notion of a random attractor. A random attractor is defined algorithmically as follows. You're given some set u of nodes, which you said a equals, you initialize it with the set u. And so as long as you added node to a in the last iteration, you keep on performing this iteration. You add to A all player one vertices uh, where all the out edges go into A. Okay? Or, so let's say if you had this, and you also add to A all random vertices that have at least one out edge into A. Okay? So, like here, if this was your set U initially, then this one does not have all its out edges going into U. You can't add it yet. But this one has at least one edge going into U. So, you can add it to A. And now, um, you have added something to A in the last iteration, so you continue. So now for this node, all its out edges go into A. So now you would add this node. And also, this one now has one edge going into A, so this one. And that's it. You cannot add any more nodes. So this would have been the random attractor of U. And what does the random attractor actually capture? Well, all vertices um, that are in the random attractor have a positive probability uh, to reach U no matter what player one does. So the random attractor are these nodes where player one with at least constant probability will get into, meaning he cannot get to the good sets. So these will be the bad guys. So if you know that you for somehow bad set, then these are the ones where player one will not be able to get to the good set because with constant probability he will get to the bad set, so he cannot with probability one get to the good set. Okay, so this is the random attractor. And now here is a very simple uh, NM algorithm for um, reachability in MDPs. 
um, which works as follows. It's also called almost true reachability, so ASR, almost true reachability, which works as follows. Um, so you have your set T, and first you do just regular graph reachability. So ignoring the type of the nodes, whether they play a one or random, you just do reachability, and this gives you some set S. S will be an overestimate of the winning set. There will be guys in there who will not then finally be in the winning set, but at least they are an overestimate, so you know everybody who is not in S, they are really bad. They will definitely not be in the winning set, because they don't even have a path to T. T is where you want to get to. Okay. So now you can take V minus S out, but not just V minus S, you can take out the whole, the whole random attractor of V minus S. So everybody, every node that has, might get pulled into V minus S with non-zero probability. You take them all out. And then you repeat, you set V to be V minus A, and you repeat until there's nobody, no such node left, until A is empty. And if A is empty, then you know V minus S must also have been empty. So everybody can at least do the graph reachability in T. And then there's a somewhat sophisticated proof uh, that shows that actually in this set, in this case, S, whatever left then in S, is actually a good set, is the winning set. So as long as every node can actually reach T, and if you have taken out all its, <coughs> for the bad ones, you have taken out all the random attractor, then you can prove, it's not obvious, okay, then you can prove that this is actually the winning set. Okay, so this algorithm was known, and actually I had, uh, Krishnando had improved it to m to the 1.5, and I had improved it with Krishnando to n squared, um, this algorithm. And now, if you want to do disjunctive reachability, remember that's what we're working on, disjunctive reachability for k targets, you could just run this k times and get this running time. However, we can do it better. Um, we can do it, I'll skip this example, okay, this just shows how the things look. Works. Um, and I need my very last definition, uh, which is also a good problem to know, actually, because, again, we don't know a linear time algorithm. And this here is very similar to strongly connected components. So it's called maximal end component decomposition. Okay? And this is a corresponding thing to strongly connected components in graphs. And the fastest algorithm to have such a thing, to compute such a thing, is the minimum of n squared and m to the 1.5. So again, open here, what's the real answer? And there's no lower bound either for this problem. So the definition is for, as follows. An end component, U, is a set of vertices such that the graph induced by U is strongly connected. And no random vertex has an outgoing edge uh, to a vertex in V minus U. So for example, um, if you had something like this. OK, so this would be a, a nice end component. Okay. Um, there could be, let's say, like this. Still, this here is a nice end component. But if this fellow here has an edge now here, then this is no longer an end component, right? Because um, there is a ra this random node has an outgoing edge, so now it just breaks up into individual nodes. So this graph has no end component. And now what we want to compute is the maximal end component decomposition, which for a graph finds all the end components, all the setwise maximal set inclusion-wise maximal end components, just like the strongly connected components are the maximal, strongly connected uh, pieces. So you want to find the maximal end component, and uh, you want to make sure, and individual nodes. Like here, you would just return all individual nodes. Okay? So, and the nice observation that we had was as follows. Um, Either all vertices, assume you have computed for your graph this maximal end component de uh, decomposition, then either all vertices belong of a, a maximal end component belong to the winning set or none. So within a maximal end component, it's all or none are in the winning set. And thus, this gives rise to the idea you could actually contract all these end components to just one node. And then whatever is the decision, uh, decision for the node in the contractor graph will be the decision for all the guys in inside. And the nice thing is, if there are no maxima end component, uh, if you contract them, then now you can show that there's no non-trivial end component. A trivial end component is a one node with a self-loop. Play a one, one node with a self-loop. So there will be no non-trivial uh, end component. And now we had this observation that if the MDB contains no non-trivial end component, then actually just one iteration of this previous algorithm suffices to find a winning set. Okay, and here, um, you have to modify the proof of the previous algorithm to prove this, okay? So this gives us this very simple final algorithm. You compute the maximum end component decomposition, you contract all the maximum end components that you found, and now for each of your uh, target sets, 
you run one iteration of the previous algorithm, which means you find the set S that, that can reach TI, you take out its random attractor, there's some slight modification which doesn't affect the running time, and then V minus A is the winning set okay, for this target. And so since you are dis disjunctive, disjunctive, you will take the union uh, of all these winning sets. And then in the end, of course, you have to undo the contraction to output the final winning set. And so this algorithm has just running time k times m, right, because this is just linear time, all the steps here are linear time, k times m plus the time for the MAC decomposition, which I told you was n squared or m to the 1.5. And so this upper bound here actually matches the lower bound, um, which you, the previous lower bounds you could also rewrite as follows. And so for k that is at least square root m, the upper bound and the lower bound matches, because then the MAC does not dominate the running time. The time to compute the MEC doesn't dominate the running time. Okay, so now um, what are the open problems? Well, it turns out that for all these problems here, the reachability in MDPs that I just talked about, or computing the MEC decomposition, or the street problem, and for the street problem that's even true in graphs, there is no linear time algorithm, and there are no conditional lower bounds. So it's wide open, what is the right answer here? The upper bounds are like this. And then also the Rabin on MDP still has a gap. So we have shown this lower bound, but we have an upper bound that's only like this. We have an algorithm for this, so there's also a gap. And then for some of these lower bounds, we actually need the combinatorial assumption. Like for triangle detection, the assumption is there's no combinatorial algorithm uh, for orthogonal vectors. There's no combinatorial algorithm for that. And what if you, assume, what if you res uh, remove this assumption? Um, this means that now algorithms with fast matrix multiplications are allowed. But there is no algorithm using any tricks of fast matrix multiplication to give a fast, like would give a fast algorithm. Okay, all the algorithms that are known are combinatorial. So could there be fast algorithms using some ideas from fast matrix multiplication? Thank you. Questions? Yes? You showed the lower bound of k times n squared or so, but only when k is linear, so do you know anything when k is <laughs> No, also a good open question, yes. Can these reductions be adapted, for example, yeah. Yes? Are you publishing in the model checking community? And yes. It? Well, actually they like it, yeah, it gets into all good conferences. So this one we are only going to submit now uh -huh. to leaks, but uh, the previous paper where we had this improved algorithms for street got into leaks as well. So logic in computer science conference, yeah. They, they're very interested, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have really massive graphs, right? So super linear algorithms, are they of use to them? No, that's why it's so important to get down to linear, yes. M to the 1.5, okay. you're trying to eventually push it down to linear. Yes, so for these problems at least. Yes, but yes, they do have massive graphs and getting it down from n squared to n would be huge. And also usually their graphs are actually sparse. So very often m is order n. Yeah. So yes, they're definitely interested, especially they had not heard of fine grain complexity at all, so. so that's definitely interesting. But so that's why I wanted to tell you about these problems. Uh, there is actually a community that cares about it. So beyond the MDPs, there's the concept of a stochastic game where you have uh, player one, player two, who is the adversary of player one, and also random nodes. And you could raise all these questions for stochastic games. Yes. So these, actually these, uh, so I looked at least at the restricted version where I have player one and player two, but no random nodes, yeah. so, so these game graphs. And so there, for Pushy, for example, we also have an n squared algorithm. Um, but some of the other problems are already, like the disjunctive reachability, already MP-complete. So uh, very soon there you get to MP-completeness. But there are also very interesting open problems, like the parity uh, games, whether you can get a sub-exponential time algorithm there, yes. Uh, but there's a whole bunch, there's another, yeah. These are the more complicated uh, graph models that I didn't even talk about, yeah. More questions? Let's thank Monica again.